Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming to this month's talk. We're going to talk about uh, Joe Kittinger, and let me uh, kind of clue you in. I've talked to him a few times, and the first time I interviewed him, I said, I've heard your name pronounced a number of different ways. What's correct? And he said, Kittinger. Everybody pronounces it wrong, but it's Kittinger, so that's what we'll go with today. The year is 1950, and a young lieutenant is living the dream. He joined the United States Air Force the year before. He was accepted to flight school out of his native Florida. And that's what he's doing now. He is flying airplanes. And one day, he lands his jet after a mission, a sortie, taxis up to the ramp, and standing there is his first shirt. Now, those of you who've been in the military know the first shirt. And he gets out, and the first shirt does not look happy, and says, you are wanted in the squadron commander's office now. And so the lieutenant says, well, what? What's going on? The, the shirt says not one more word. So the lieutenant stows his gear and goes into the commander's office, and he's standing there, and the squadron commander looks up and says, lieutenant, why haven't you written your mother? <laughs> well, I've been busy, I'm trained. Oh, no, 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 no. There's more to the story. Your mother didn't hear from you. She thought something might have happened. So she called her United States Senator, who called the Chief of the Air Force, who called me. Well, I'll write her a letter tonight. No, 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 no. And let me read you the direct quote from the commander. You're going to sit down and write a letter right now. <laughs> then you're going to address the envelope, put a stamp on it, and hand it to me. In addition, I'm removing you from the flying schedule tomorrow so that you will have some time to contemplate the fact that you will never again neglect to write your mother when a member of this squad. <laughs> he also got commanded to write a letter to his mother every week, which he followed dutifully. And that pretty much is how Joe Kittinger started his career in the United States Air Force. There you see a young uh, Joe Kittinger right there. He joined the Air Force, as I said, in 1949. He was accepted to pilot school. It was a dream of his. He got on a train, and it took five days of sitting in a seat, didn't have a sleeper. You're in the military getting ready to go to basic. They don't give you the, uh, all the amenities. And so five days to ride the train from Florida to Goodfellow Air Force Base in San Angelo, Texas. Uh, I've lived there. It's a multi-unit training base now, but then they did a lot of pilot training. And that's where he uh, got his first experience behind the, the uh, stick in his jets. He uh, did not see combat in Korea, which was something that he really wanted to do. He's, a, he's training to be a combat pilot, and that never happened. He ended up flying NATO jets in Copenhagen, and when Korea was over, he basically was told, you're going to fly for Strategic Air Command, SAC. Uh, that was not something he wanted to do. He didn't want to fly big aircraft, he wanted to fly jets. So he asked for an assignment at Edwards Air Force Base. They didn't send him to Edwards. They sent him to Holloman Air Force Base in Alamo, Florida. <laughs> and that was the first move that really changed the direction of his life. When he got here, and he came actually through Cloudcroft, and he says when he went through Cloudcroft and looked at the Tularosa Basin, he was just in awe of what he, uh, what he saw and what was here. And he realized that this area was an aviator's dream because of the the weather, the ability to fly just about anything. And while he was here, he flew seven days a week. He flew the P-51, the B-25, the B-26, the L-19, the L-20, the C-45, the C-47, the F-80, 86, 89, 94, the F-100, and the F-104. He says if it was there, he would fly it. Now, the other thing that changed the direction of his life while he was here at Holloman was a chance meeting one day crossing paths with Dr. John Staff. And Dr. John Staff was head of the Aeromedical Laboratory. 
uh, he had the reputation of being a mad genius and an evangelist for the notion of space travel. And Stapp was looking for a temporary duty assignment, a pilot that could help them on some of the work that they were doing, and it interested in his conversation with Dr. Stapp. It interested him, so he went back to his commander and asked to be temporarily assigned. The commander made a comment to the effect of, well, I don't know really what they're doing over there. It's all hush-hush, it's all secret, but if you want to do it, fine, go over there and do it. And he became integral in the work of uh, Dr. Staff at the Aero Med Lab. Now, there you see uh, Dr. Staff. Until I found this picture, I never knew that he had actually spent some time aboard what's colloquially known as the Vomit Comet. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, they fly up, they fly down, so you get a few seconds of gravity, and then they fly up, and then they fly down, and they train pilots and astronauts kind of what it will be like when you get into a, an area where you don't have any gravity. So that's John Stapp. Don't know who the other gentleman is, but that's Stapp. This photograph right here was the day, December 10, 1954, that Dr. Stapp rode the rocket sled from zero to 632 miles an hour in about five seconds, and to a dead stop in 1.4 seconds. So Stapp wanted to film, he knew he could get film on the ground, but Stapp wanted film of what was happening from an overhead view, and the only way to do that was get a pilot to fly. It sounds easy, but in reality it wasn't. Stapp sat down, he did the math, and he told Kittinger, here's what you have to do. You have to be at 3,285 feet. You have to be going 522 feet per second. At a certain point, you have to accelerate another 35 feet per second and do that for 12 seconds. At that point, you will be at the takeoff point where they light, light the rockets and the sled goes down the track. Now, Stapp didn't tell him that he was going to be on the rocket sled. He just said, you need to be there when the rocket sled takes off. So, Kittinger said, well, I need to practice this. And he took the math, and he did 20 practice runs. He didn't hit the mark on one of those runs. He was a few seconds early. He was a few seconds late. But he never hit the mark on any of the, on any of the runs. It was not until the day of the actual event, you see Kittinger in his T-33, <coughs> that he hit it perfectly when it actually counted. And that photograph of him flying over is about the point where Dr. Stapp hits the water breaking sec uh, section probably at about 6.3 seconds before he comes to his dead stop. I think he endured 83 G's and a negative 41 G's at the actual stop. And he did not, uh, Kittinger did not learn that Stapp was going to be on that sled until the day of the actual test, which made the anxiety and the nervousness to get it right a little bit more. So from that point, Stapp said, I need a permanent pilot here, because this worked out so well. He realized Kittinger's ability, and he said, I need a permanent pilot. And Kittinger went to his squadron commander and said, they'd like me off temporary duty, and they'd like me on permanent duty. And his squadron commander signed off and, and made the comment that you've got more guts than brains, but if that's what you want to do, I'll sign the paper. That began the program of what Stapp initially called Project Daedalus, I believe is how you pronounce it. Until they learned that there was an atomic airplane a secret at the time, atomic airplane project with the same name, and so they changed it to Operation Manhai, which I imagine most of us here are familiar with. These two folks here, this is Otto Winsen and Vera Winsen, and they were the balloon makers. Otto was a German immigrant, and Vera was equally adept. She had uh, quite a bit of money that helped found their company, Winds and Balloons and Winds and Research. And they were quite adept at the art of building the actual balloon itself. Now, the balloons that took them up in their uh, projects, Mannheim and Excelsior, were actually uh, less than the width of a hair when they uh, inflated them and went up. Uh, that was the, the technology that these two right here were able to, to develop. So they were the uh, folks who developed the balloon, and a lot of pilots were tested. They had to go through psychological testing, 
they had to go through a 24-hour period of cluster of uh, to see if they had claustrophobia. And if you can imagine being in that situation, and not all of them made it, there's a story where one of the candidates actually nearly had a coronary after 24 hours of being isolated. No lights, nothing else, no sensory, everything was uh, deprived. But the folks who made it out and were chosen were Kittinger, of course. You see him on the left in both photographs. Dave Simons, who's on the right in the first photograph and in the center in the first photograph. And then Duke Gildenberg, he was not a pilot, he was the weather forecaster. And Duke Gildenberg was apparently an extreme expert at weather forecasting. He nearly always got it right. I'll tell you here in a little while, the moment he did not get it right. But they made the comment something to the effect of, it's 100 degrees outside and Duke Gildenberg says it's gonna snow, we're putting on our snowsuits. <laughs> That's how accurate he was. The pilots then, once they were chosen, were required to learn how to pilot a balloon by themselves. And, and I think that's what they're out here doing on the right photograph. If you look closely, it's not easily visible, but if you look closely in the right photograph, you see the balloon inflated behind them. These two photographs right here, Dave Simons died in 2010, and his daughter bequeathed to the museum just boxes and boxes of photographs and slides, and these are two of those right here. So these are more personal and intimate views that weren't official U.S. Air Force or government photographs. They're just out having a good time learning how to fly their balloons. And that led to the first mission, and that was uh, Project Manhai, Manhai 1, which took place on June 2nd of 1957. So who was going to fly that first balloon? Dave Simons wanted to do it. He was the scientist. The first choice was uh, Demi McClure, Cliff Demi McClure. He was an experienced pilot, but Stapp wanted an experienced experimental pilot, and that fell to Joe Kittinger, which Dave Simons was not happy about. There was some tension there. Dave Simons wanted to be the first person up. And eventually he would fly, but he would set his own records when he did that. So Manhai took place on June 2nd, 1957 at the South St. Paul Airport. I believe that they went up to that area uh, because at that particular time of the year, the winds in this area were, were more vigorous and they looked around for an area where they could go and not uh, have that issue. Because remember, the balloons are about as thin as a width of hair or a little bit less. So they had to protect that balloon. At the time, it was a huge investment. And the military and the government didn't necessarily support this. It was in the 1930s when lighter than air, the United States... Uh, military quit doing lighter than air. So this is kind of a new project. John Staff is a maverick. Remember, they called him a mad genius. And they didn't have a lot of money, so they borrowed money from the Winsons to be able to do this. And I don't believe that the Winsons ever got paid back. So money was very, very tight. Kittinger is chosen. He would ascend that day to 96,784 feet. He entered the gondola about one o'clock in the morning, and it would be about five and a half hours until he lifted off. So you can see why they went through the claustrophobic tests. And there in this partial pressure suit during the training uh, for the choice of candidates, they had to sit in this suit for uh, a long extended period. They were tight, they were torturous, it's described thusly, and you had to be able to endure that. And they were in the partial pressure suits because when the human body gets to a certain point in the atmosphere where the air is less dense, the body can literally explode, and if there were a decompression within the capsule itself, then they had to have something, be wearing something that would protect the human body. So finally, uh, about 6.30 in the morning, he lifts off. He rose 400 feet per minute. He hits the troposphere at about 45,000 feet. The air is less dense. That exceeds to about 500 feet per minute. And he hits an area of the jet stream where the winds are really bad and they, the balloon became brittle and they hit the, the gondola and it knocked it nearly on its side, which gave him some tension, obviously. And it was about this point, uh, 78 minutes into the flight, where the radio quit working. Uh, miles? I'd actually have to get it out of the calculator and look at that. 
I will do that afterwards. Uh, the radio quit working. Fortunately, they had a telegraph, Morse code, in the, in the uh, craft here. And Kittinger says, I had to brush off my Morse code, hadn't done it in a while. And that's how we communicated back and forth. And about that point, Kittinger realized that there was a problem. The oxygen was venting out into the atmosphere. A technician mistakenly reversed the lines, so all of the oxygen, oxygen was venting out, and he would have nothing to breathe. So he switched. He did have a personal oxygen tank, and he switched to that, and he immediately started to descend at about 1,000 feet per minute. Shortly after, the technicians and Dr. Staff on the ground realized that there was an issue. Their data showed them that the oxygen was quickly depleting. And so even though they couldn't, they couldn't uh, communicate verbally, they sent him a message that said, descend immediately. And by this point, Kinnear is already doing that. He's, he's well ahead of them. Well, Kittinger is a practical joker. John Staff is a practical joker. In fact, he wrote a couple of books on puns that are out of print now, but uh, he was the guy that said if you're in a, uh, an airport and everybody but yourself is sick and you get sick as of a terminal illness because you're in an airport. <laughs> <laughs> so he's descending at 1,000 feet per minute. Staff is ordering, it, ordering him to get down, and Kittinger decides he's going to have some fun. He taps back, come up and get me. And Stapp is not happy. He thinks that the oxygen is depleted, and so his brain is starting to get foggy. And he gets back on the ground. Kettinger thinks it's funny. Stapp does not think it's funny. But he was able to descend safely. He actually landed some distance away in a shallow creek, and by this time he had an open porthole. He couldn't, as you can see, you can't see out of those portholes. They had a mirror that they could look into that would reflect the view from the outside so he could kind of see what was going on. And he landed with the open porthole up. If he'd have landed the other direction, most likely water would have entered the capsule and he could have drowned. But he was fortunate in that aspect. And they finally showed up and they made him climb in and out of that capsule four times so the photographers could get all the pictures they wanted to get. <laughs> that was man high one. Got a question for you. Yes, sir. How were they able to get that altitude so precise? At 96,784 feet? Uh -huh. That's just the where he, he was supposed to actually go a bit higher, but that's just the point he ascended to before he realized he had an issue with his oxygen. I didn't know it was 784 feet, not 790 feet. Well, they had an altimeter in there, I think. <laughs> you can see all the equipment that's in there. <laughs> but that's what's in the official record. Okay. <laughs> Yes, yes, they did. Uh, they did put a cover on there, so he necessarily could not get himself out. They had to wait for the rescue team. Is that a helium balloon? Uh, yes, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. I'm curious about the delay from the time he gets in the gondola until the time he goes off. It takes that long to fill the balloon. Um, that's part of it. The other part is that they wanted to wait till the first sunlight where the sun comes up, and I believe that kind of aids in the expansion of the balloon and going up. Plus, they wanted to be able to see what was happening, and they wanted him inside to be able to see what was happening, which necessarily you might not be able to experience if it's totally dark outside. Early morning like that's the best time to take pictures. Is it? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's why all the tests out here at White Sands usually are between 7 and 8 o'clock in the yeah. morning. It's got good side sunlight. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of different reasons. So, the second mission is Dr. Simons. Now, I will mention that at some point, uh, Vera Winson became Mrs. Simons. I'm not sure of the story behind that, but, uh, and I'm not sure at what point it was, but they were married for the rest of their lives until he passed away in 2010. Man High 2 took place on August 19th and 20th, so we're coming up on the anniversary of that. That was in 1957. That took place in the Portsmouth Mine in Crosby, Minnesota, so they could start inflating the balloon before it got above the uh, top of the mine itself. 
and he ascended to 101,516 feet. He is the first person to spend a night in space. And that's why it says the 19th through the 20th. And if you can imagine spending 32 hours in that position right there in this craft with a cover on it. Uh, he, as night approached, of course, it gets cooler and cooler, and the balloon started to lose some of his buoyancy and started to descend. They had a radio antenna, I have read, that was up to 100 feet long below him, so communications would be really good. They learned a lesson from the radio problem uh, in Manhai 1. The issue here was that as he looked out the porthole beneath him, there was a massive storm, a lightning storm going on. And here comes the, the uh, craft down, and he was really concerned that that antenna was going hit, to get hit by lightning, and that electricity is going to travel up. But fortunately, it did not. His other issue was he was so excited and entranced and busy doing what he was supposed to do that he only napped for an hour. And he failed to eat, so his blood sugar started to have issues. And he started to slur his speech and have some issues with his cognitive abilities. And at that point, Dr. Staff shut down the uh, project and had him descend. But yes, the first person to spend a night in space. He eventually became a clinical professor and wrote numerous books and did research on overcoming pain. And he says that nobody ever wanted to interview him about that. He did some groundbreaking research in overcoming pain. They just wanted to talk about this mission right here. The Man High 3 was piloted by Cliff Demi McClure. There's a reason for his nickname Demi. His family were big Democrats, and he was born the night that FDR was first elected. And so they gave him the nickname of Demi, Demi Democrat. And he flew on October 8th of 1958, he's passed away as well, from the South St. Paul Airport, and ascended to 98,100 feet. They were supposed to go higher on this mission, but the cabin began to lose its cooling abilities. The temperature shot up, and his personal temperature went up to well over 100 degrees. And he started to have health issues as well. And so at 98,100 feet, staff ordered him down. And that was the end of the Mannheim missions. So they had proved that you could get into the upper atmosphere, that you could function as long as your health was good, as long as you ate, and a human being could function at those, uh, at those altitude levels. Next came the Excelsior missions, and Kittinger flew all of these because these were the missions where he jumped out of a perfectly good, perfectly good uh, craft. These were open craft. These were not sealed craft, which made it easier for him to step out and jump. Excelsior 1 lifted off on November 16th of 1959 from Truth or Consequences, and he went to 76,000 feet. And there was uh, an issue with this mission that almost killed him. He had a seat, as you saw in the earlier photographs, that the pilot would sit on. And it was a rather ratty looking seat. And there were lots of photographs being taken. So one of the woodworkers at the facility out at Holloman Air Force Base decided to make a nicer looking seat and made it a little bit smaller than what it was. That didn't, you know, an inch smaller, that's not a big difference. But one of the purposes for that seat was that they put water bottles underneath it, and in the process of freezing, water bottles will give off a little bit of heat. Uh, not much, but you know, when you're up at the level he got to and it's minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit, a little bit of heat is a good thing. So these water bottles freeze, and because the seat was smaller and a little bit shorter, some frost formed on the seat. He's wearing, on all three of his missions, and you'll see in a photograph a little bit later, a, a butt pack, which had instrumentation in it, weighed about, I think, 130, 150 pounds. It measured his uh, rate of descent, it would take the temperatures, it would take other instrument readings from that altitude, and 
when the frost formed on the seat, it basically acted like glue and it hooked that butt pack to the seat and he couldn't stand up. So he starts wriggling around and it only took about 16 seconds for him to get it loose and jump out, which doesn't seem like a lot, but when your automatic timer on your parachute has started, that is a huge issue. What they were trying to do in Man High 1 was perfect parachutes in case pilots had to eject out of their aircraft. In tests they, with anthropomorphic dummies, they found out that the, the parachutes, when they malfunctioned, the dummy would go into a flat spin. And as a human being, the blood will leave the brain and you'll pass out. And if your secondary chute doesn't open up, you'll hit the ground. So he finally uh, gets loose, he jumps, and his parachute comes out 16 seconds before it's supposed to come out. It's not at the altitude. And guess what? He goes into a flat spin and he passes out. And it wasn't until about 10,000 feet that fortunately his secondary chute opened up. He regained consciousness and he was able to land safely. They learned a lot from that mission. So when they went to Excelsior II on December 11th of 1959, and that was the first of two missions from right here in the Tudor Rosa Basin, 74,700 feet, they corrected all those problems. It was textbook perfect. And so they were excited about the next mission, which would be Excelsior III. These photographs right here, uh, this one is actually a test run for suiting him up. They went through everything repeatedly. Uh, they tested his suit, make sure he didn't have a pressure leak. And so you actually see the test right here. Now, this is the actual day of Excelsior Three. The suit and the equipment he's wearing to keep him warm weigh about 100 pounds. He is packed. You see it on the bottom of his lower back there. That's 130, 150 pounds. So when he jumped, he's weighing more than 300 pounds. And there was an issue with this mission as well. The first issue was that Duke Gildenberg had predicted perfect day, cloudless skies. And they get out early in the morning, and as you can see, that's not a cloudless sky. Well, Duke's in Alamogordo, and he's doing some checkup uh, weather forecast, and he realizes that he was wrong. And so he gets in his car, he rushes to the scene, and he arrives a minute after, after uh, Kittinger lifts off. And you see Kittinger in his uh, open gondola right here. You see him preparing to get into the, into the uh, craft there, and you see the balloon expanding. You also see a placard that's on the base of the craft there, and it says this is the highest step in the world. And the, the idea for having that was his son was eating cereal one morning, and some of you may remember, some of us who are a certain age may remember, that you could get records and license plates for your bicycle and other things on the back of cardboard boxes. So his son says, Dad, uh, you ought to have a license plate on your, on your craft. And so they made that right there. This is the highest step in the world. And on some of his earlier flights, he actually had a cardboard license plate inside with him. So he ascends, and he realizes on the way up, even though they've tested it and tested it and tested it, his right glove fails to pressurize. And he's thinking, should I report it? Should I not report it? And he decides not to report it because they're borrowing money from the Winsons. They're out of money. If staff aborts the mission, then there will be no more missions. So he doesn't report it until he gets to altitude and he radios the doctor that his right glove failed to pressurize. At that altitude, his right hand is now twice its normal size and he's going to experience some frostbite. And the doctor starts answering questions, but really there's nothing that at this point that that he can do. And he says a silent prayer and he jumps. His time to get to earth was 13 minutes and 45 seconds. And that includes the point where the parachute actually opened up. Now, I'm going to say at this point that that was not the first Man High 3 flight. There was actually a test flight two months earlier. 
And that was done at about 100 feet out here over the White Sands Dunes, the National Monument, now a national park. And it uh, carried Winson, Otto Winson, and it carried uh, a pilot by the name of Grover Schock, who unless you know this story, his name is really not written in any of the history books. And for some reason, as they're skimming over the dunes at 100 feet altitude, there was a malfunction and the craft plummeted to the ground from 100 feet. It severely injured Winson. He was in the hospital for several months. Bone shattered, uh, a lot of damage. Shock, it, some device in the balloon cut his throat from ear to ear. And there was a medic that was at the launch site, and the medic was kind of concerned because they didn't hear from him. And so the medic gets in his car, and he rushes to the scene well over the speed limit. At one point, he, he passes a New Mexico State Police officer, who gives chase. The medic refuses to stop. Gets to the scene, he finds shock, and he saves his life with his medical training. Anybody want to take a guess as to who that medic was? No, it wasn't staff. It was someone who had become crucial out here. It was uh, uh, Ed Dittmer, if you're familiar with Ed Dittmer. Really? Yes. Ed Dittmer saved Grover Shock's life. And, of course, at that point, the state officer realized what was going on, and I don't think he ticketed it. So, so now we have, uh, man, or we have Excelsior 3 here, uh, where staff is, uh, or uh, Kittinger is jumping. I said it takes 13 minutes and 45 seconds to get down. You can see the cloud cover that, that Duke Gildenberg said was not going to be there. He's at 19 miles up. That's how high he is at this point. And he weighs about 320 pounds, and he's right-handed, and his hand is twice its size, and he can't reach back and cut the pack off. So he hits the ground at 320 pounds. And you see here images of his parachute. He's in control all the time. On the right, I think you see the uh, parachute start to deploy. He says when, I, when he jumped out, because he's so high, there was no sense of movement whatsoever. And he thought that maybe something malfunctioned, and he's hooked to the he's hooked to the craft right here, and he's not going anywhere. But he says, I rolled over onto my back and looked up, and he saw the craft getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And he realizes the speed at which he's falling, and he says he actually broke the sound barrier in the fall, the first person to break the sound barrier and not be in an aircraft. <laughs> So then you see him on the ground right here, and I like this picture right here. Take a look at his right hand. Even though he's back uh, on Earth, it's still a pretty good sized hand. It has not fully recovered from the pressurization or lack thereof that uh, he endured while he was, he was in the uh, altitude in the craft. Now, at this point, a lot of what they do, had been doing had been secret, but he survived it, they proved some things, and the press is there, and they allow the press to come and take pictures. And while they're doing that and interviewing him, an officer comes up and says, you're wanted in Los Angeles right now for an interview with Walter Cronkite. So he gets in his T-33, and he flies to LAX. He stands on the, on the ramp. He does his interview with Walter Cronkite. He gets back in his T-33 and flies back down in Florida. Now, as you can imagine, the accolades that he got were numerous and many. He won the Harmon Trophy, which was an honor that you win for its contributing to aviation. There are three given every year for different reasons. He, he won that year. You see some of the, some of the uh, protective clothing he was wearing. And he was on the cover of magazines. He was the feature subject in many other stories, whether it be on television, whether it be in publications. And in his book, and even to this day, he will tell you that it should have been John Staff that got the accolades, because if it had not been for John Staff ramrodding these through, that this project would never have taken place and they would never have gotten the data that they were able to get. There were supposed to be two more missions, but they were out of money. And so that was the end of, of uh, that testing. 
I got a question on the Mongols of Anhai. Yes. Uh, their descents, were they able, uh, obviously they must have been able to control their rate of descent. Yes. But, uh, about what, what was the impact? Uh, were there any Gs? Uh, I don't think there were Gs. Um, they were still in the balloon. Yeah. They were just letting the, the chemical out. Uh, I've read that it wasn't the most pleasant of landings, yeah. which is why when it came time for the Apollo testing, if you notice the little Joe 2 right out here, that was used for testing uh, the parachute deployment for the Apollo missions in case they had to abort. And the daisy track out here was used to test uh, different styles of cushioning, including car seats, to see what would best protect when they splash down. But even even with uh, the Apollo, I'll tell you, it was not the most pleasant of landings. But at least you're back safely on terra firma, or in the case of uh, Apollo water. So. Here's one of the accolades right here. There's another incredible picture of him falling. There were two missions following that, and those were stargazer missions. This uh, was done, you see Kittinger on the left there, and these were to do astronomy from a high altitude. And the gentleman on the right is uh, an astronomer, I believe his name is Bill White. I looked him up yesterday. He's still alive at 101 years old. Uh, Kittinger is still alive at, what, 92? Or 94. That capsule there, that looks like maybe something that would cushion. It does, yeah. Yeah, yeah it does. And that's probably, yeah, that's probably why it's there. Uh, the project director for this was Dr. Alan Hynek, who was the big UFO guy, if you're familiar with that uh, area. Stargazer 1 took place on December 13th of 1962. They were up for, I believe, about 18 and a half hours doing astronomy uh, before they came back down. And Stargazer 2 was to have taken place in March of 1963, but there were repeated issues. Some of them were electrical. Uh, one day, Kittinger's playing tennis and he sprains his ankle, so they delay it again. But there were numerous issues over about a five-week period until April of 1963, and they are out here at Holloman, ready to lift off. And a static electricity charge hits the squib and deploys the balloon. And the balloon starts to ascend. It's beautiful. It goes and goes and goes, and it leaves the craft on the ground. <laughs> so the balloon went up, the craft did not, after the balloon separated. And that was the end of the Stargazer missions. <laughs> and between those two missions, Kittinger actually appeared on the game show To Tell the Truth, if you remember those old game shows. I think you can find it on the Game Show channel now. I tried to find him online, but I was unable to do that. So after all of that, he could probably have retired with honors, but he, uh, loving to fly and wanting to do combat, he decided to volunteer to go to Vietnam. And on March 2nd of 1972, he's credited with shooting down a MiG, see a MiG here, in his F-4 Phantom. It was his third tour of duty that year. And on May 11, 1972, shortly after that mission, he was scheduled to rotate out and come back to the United States. And on May 11, 1972, he and his Wizzo, his weapon system officer, got shot down. And they were captured. And they were sent to the Hanoi Hilton, where he was not treated kindly. They knew who he was. A lot of pilots and others were in the Hanoi Hilton, including uh, Senator John McCain who has since passed. But it was not a pleasant place to be. Uh, he was in somewhat within the confines in a leadership role, trying to keep up the morale of the other uh, prisoners. Uh, he was given a leadership role shortly after he joined the United States Air Force because they learned he'd been in the Boy Scouts and he was the only one who had any concept of what leadership was. Uh, and so the prison where he was at, that's the official name, the Ho'olo prison is, is translates basically as fiery furnace or hell's hole. And after 10 months, he was released. I think there was a prisoner exchange. They walked the prisoners they released across the bridge and the United States released some prisoners and he was uh, released. 
And at some point then after that, he retired. I like this quote. This is from an Air Force magazine. Heroism is not limited to combat, but the valor of only a few, like Joe Kittinger, is tested in both peace and war. But wait, there's more. So he retires back to his native Florida, and he meets a restaurateur who owns a restaurant called Rosie O'Grady's, who was an avid aviator who owned airplanes and owned balloons. And the restaurateur said, my balloons are yours and my airplanes are yours. And so he uh, kind of went into the job of taking folks up for airplane rides. And I believe there's a website you can see more, rosieogradys.com or something like that. If you Google it, it will come up. That led to him competing in flights across the Atlantic Ocean. And in 1982 and 84, he won the Gordon Bennett balloon race. He did compete in a couple of others. One year he came in second, one year he came in third, but those two years. He won. In 1984, in the first picture on the left, you see him raising a toast as he prepares to get in his, to his balloon in Caribou, Maine, and try to set a record to go to Italy. And he did. He set a uh, record, 83 hours, 3,543.7 miles. <laughs> uh, those records have never been broken. He still holds those records. And there on the right, you see him in front of his balloon as it's deflating after he lands in Italy. And from his hometown newspaper, you can see some of the headlines. He's, he has the record. He didn't really know where he was going to land. He was just going to try to go as far as he could possibly go. And I love that picture of the balloon right there. So, okay, because I remember at Rosie O'Grady's, they gave balloon rides. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that... He was the pilot. Kittinger was the pilot? Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that takes me back to high school. Yep. Just... He was the pilot. Yeah. Holy cow. Now, last thing, basically, I, I have to discuss. Uh, numerous times over the years, he's come back to Holloman Air Force Base. Some years back, they actually tore down the balloon branch. That was sad to see that go. If you've ever been in there, their equipment that they use still for current day missions was, was like watching a 1950s B science fiction movie. It was the equipment from the 50s, and they still used it. But numerous times he would come back. He came back in the late 70s, early 80s to visit with Dr. Stapp. He came back in the early 2000s to attend an award ceremony for airmen and officers at Holloman Air Force Base. And he, along with Dr. Staff's brother, Dr. Staff had died by then, and Duke Gilbert were the three guests of honor. And it was fun to just kind of stand nearby and listen to the stories they told. He came back here about 10 years ago, and these are photographs that I took from there. Now remember, he got shot down in an F-4 Phantom over Vietnam. And when he came back to visit, they accorded him the honor of actually sitting again in an F-4 Phantom. He's walking out to the flight line. I can just imagine the stories they're telling there. They let him climb up into the cockpit, and there he is right there. At this point, the F-4s were drones, so they weren't piloted. Occasionally, there would be a pilot along to kind of report on what was going on, but they were being used as drones and as test targets. Now, one of the things I'll tell you when you do PowerPoints is don't put up high-dense uh, text. <laughs> and the only reason I put this up, these are just a few of the awards, accomplishments, and honors over his career that he has achieved. I won't leave that up to you all review. <laughs> so, a couple more things. Some things that uh, are not true about the colonel. There has long been a conspiracy theory that in 1947, he was the mysterious red-haired military officer at the Roswell crash. Remember, he didn't join the Air Force until 1949. And he would have only been 19 years old when that happened. This right here is, sometimes I like to haunt old bookstores, you find some really wonderful things. And I found this book incredible but true. 
And this is incredible, but it's not true. It shows him jumping out of a dirigible. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one other thing I want to add is this story was in the Alamogordo newspaper during Man High One, the first flight. And I asked him about this one time. He said, it's not true. It never happened. But the Alamogordo, you know, you believe the guy who was there. The Alamogordo paper reported that the radio actually worked, but it was too far below him in his cramped capsule to be able to reach down and chain. And so, for whatever reason, the radio was tuned to a commercial radio station coming out of Minneapolis. And the story in the Alamogordo newspaper said, as Kittinger reached 20,000 feet, the station signed on and he heard the Star Spangled Banner. At 90,000 feet, a choir began singing, My Nearer My God to Thee. Uh, it was reported, it quoted staff, Kenner says it never happened, but it's a fun fact. So that's the presentation. Uh, once again, we appreciate you coming. Uh, if there are any questions I could answer, if I don't know them, I'll try to look them up and get back to you. Sharon. Well, what can you tell us about when he um, was on the ground when Pete Schumacher went up and did the, uh, uh, the I don't remember the, how the altitude that Schumacher went up in, the Red Bull, remember? Oh, yes, yes, uh, Baumgartner. Baumgartner. Baumgartner, yes. Uh, some years back, Red Bull sponsored uh, Baumgartner, who's a daredevil, to jump out of an equally good craft. And Baumgartner was trying to break Kittinger's record, and he did. Guess who was on the flight crew for that? Kinger. Yep. Ken, Ken Kruger. Yes. He was part of that. He so. still didn't break the Kinger's free fall. Correct, yes. Yeah. But he broke the height record. Yes. So Kittinger was right there in the control room and worked with him. Red Bull sponsored that. You can find stories about that, video and pictures. And the <laughs> the suit that Baumgartner is wearing, boy, is it high twenty first century tech. <laughs> Nothing like the 100-pound suit that uh, he had to wear in 1959 and 1960. What year was this? Yeah. Yeah, it was the year, um, same year I think I took those photographs of him at Holloman Air Force Base, because while he was in the area, he went out there to visit. Billy? It, it seems like a no-brainer that Demi McClure, Kittinger, would have been part of the first team of astronauts um, with all their testing and all their experience. What kept those guys from being part of the Mercury team? Actually, Kittinger in his book, Come Up and Get Me, uh, addresses that. He said he was basically enjoying his time working with staff, getting the data that they would use, and actually flying an airplane. And uh, so that was basically it. They asked him, but he declined. Okay. Uh, McClure, I don't know. There is one more story. In 2010, I had to go to Canada for the museum and catch an airplane out of El Paso to go to Chicago to go to Toronto. And I'm standing there waiting to get on the plane. And of course, I'm the last person in line. You know how they load you up. And I'm just kind of waiting and looking around at people. And I look next to me. You're Joe Kidding, who's standing there right next to me. And he had been here. It was in August. He had been here to get together with some of his old friends at the Balloon Branch on the, let's see, that would have been, what, the 50th anniversary of the Excelsior 3 flight. And he got the biggest smile on his face. And we, while we waited, we sat there and talked. I, I talked to him on the phone, but never in person. And so we landed in Dallas, and he's kind of seated back, and I had some time to kill, so I'm just sitting in my seat. He gets up, he's in his 80s then, and he walks out, he starts up the ramp, and I get up, and I said to the, the attendant, I said, see that, see that guy right there? I said, you have no idea who that is. But you need to look up Joe Kittinger, and you need to tell your pilots that Joe Kittinger was on your airplane. <laughs> and I will tell you that if both of those pilots had passed out, he could have brought this plane out <laughs> safely and saved all of our lives. <laughs> uh, amazing man, amazing career, and he was testing technology as they were inventing it. 
very few people like that, and probably there will ever be very few people in the future that did what he did and accomplished what he did. Yes? Um, the original balloons that went up went from St. Paul, was the elevation a factor? Why there? Um, when they when they launched from the mines, it was the wind factor, because they could get a good, uh, uh, the balloons start to fill up before the winds would hit it. And the winds here in this area were a problem at, the, at those times of the year. Um, the guy that passed out after he jumped out, passed out, and then woke back up again. Kidding her? Yeah. On Man High 1? That yeah. was? The or Excelsior, Excelsior 1, yes. It was that was kidding her. Kidding. Oh, yeah. okay. And how many people that had jumped out of the balloon that did what he did, did it again besides him? So he was the only person who actually did the jumps as part of that project. Okay. He did all three of them. All of them. Uh, Kittinger oh. did Man High one, Simons did two, oh. and McClure did three, and then Excelsior one, two, and three were all kidding her. Okay. And what happened to all the balloons? Basically, by the time the balloons come back down, they've hit that temperature where it's minus 100 degrees. The balloon has become brittle. They're pretty much, they're not useful anymore. Yeah. Once you've, once you've done that and it's become somewhat damaged, you don't want to test another life with it. And something that's interesting is Kittinger's hometown was Orlando? Is I believe so, true? yes. Okay. And like I said last time, John Glenn graduated from Orlando High. Yes. <laughs> and Kittinger, yeah, because I remember going to Rosie's all the time. And the balloon rides were quite common back Yeah, he would have been violent. Yeah, it's like, wow, okay. Yep. Interesting that those two. <laughs> Who else had it? Yes, sir. Uh, speaking of the weather in the area, I found uh, a couple months ago, I found a radio sonde device up in this hiking in the Lincoln National Forest around Cloudcroft from 1972. Is it possible that Duke could have launched that? Was he still working down here in 1972? <laughs> I believe he was, yeah. he. He lived in Tularosa until he passed away some years ago. And he was fairly active for a major part of his life. As I said, you know, his weather forecast, they would stake their life on it. Except the one day where it was cloudy. <laughs> but you know what? Those clouds when he was falling, that just makes an awesome photograph. John. Oh, uh, I just wondered whatever happened to the capsules. Are you in the museums? <laughs> um, at the, I believe the man, one of the Manhigh capsules is on display at the National Museum of the Air Force in, at Wright-Patterson. Uh, I was there a few years ago. You walk through these five hangars and just kind of way at the back, out of the way, are those capsules. Like, oh yes, here's a capsule after you looked at all these awesome airplanes. Uh, but I saw that and I was with a couple of friends I went to high school with and I was like, oh, we got to look at this capsule. And they have um, a little stairway where you can walk up and look inside the portholes and you realize that the space you have in there is about the size of a telephone booth. And then you throw a human being and the equipment in there and you can imagine Dave Simons for 32 hours just kind of scrunched up in that capsule. Did, did he ever get his right hand back? Yes. Yeah, I became fully functional. I don't think the frostbite was too bad. <coughs> But it makes for a great story. Couldn't cut off, weighed 320 pounds. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Kathy, who's coming up next time?